Welcome to the Illini Inquirer podcast. It's Mondays with our All-American linebacker, Jay Lehman, and these have become pretty fun to talk about win after win after win. Six straight wins, Jay Lehman, 26-9 to at Nebraska. Uh, a third straight win over the Cornhuskers, who certainly uh, have a lot of work to do in, in their program. Uh, but Illinois faced some adversity uh, in this one, some mistakes early on, but the way I keep describing this one is kind of, kind of workmanlike. I don't know if they ever lost confidence or... You know, I ever lost confidence that they would find a way uh, to, to win this game, even with some early mistakes. Yeah, I would say Workman likes a good term, you know, and I do watch the press conference with Brett Bielma. He's always congratulating you on good questions. He really <laughs> likes your questions. He thinks that Jerry Warner has the best questions. But I, would say, I would say this, Jeremy, that, um, you know, they did scheme us up a list. Mark Whipple's a good offensive coordinator, you know. I expect him to scheme. We've seen this early in, in, in first quarter, second quarter. In the passing game, we're going to get schemed up a bit. I wouldn't even say the big passing play was schemed up. I mean, Quan Martin basically tipped the ball right before it. Sydney kind of thought that Quan had it, and the guy just kind of broke away. So they're going to get theirs. They're going to get some, right? Now, they did um, you know, they try to get Dark Angel and some of our backers in man-to-man concepts off of, you know, off of the wheel routes and with their back. They hit a couple runs early. But, again, no panic, adjustment. And again, the CUFD, champaign Urbana Fire Department, came to the rescue on many times, most notably probably in that third quarter after that Isaiah Williams fumble, uh, you know, really got negative yardage and, and then uh, got the interception as well. Yeah, Jay, what is it about Ryan Walters? I, I know Casey Thompson was out of this game. And you, you can talk about, do you think it's a different game? I still think Illinois wins because I think they would have gotten another turnover from him uh, at some point with the way they were on Trey Palmer. But, you know, the first, you know, sometimes these first drives go pretty well for the other team. And then there's adjustments. And then there's the second half where Illinois is just a complete dominant second half team, 17 points they have allowed in the second half. Uh, the last 40 minutes of this game, Nebraska had 33 yards. Obviously yeah. the quarterback had something to do with that, but what is it about as the game goes along, this Illinois staff just finds a way to put their players in the best position to dominate. Well, most offensive corners are going to use their best 15 plays. Well, a lot of their best plays in their first 15 plays as they script it because they want to see how Illinois is going to react. They're going to dial some stuff up. You want to have your offense get confidence early. So you're going to put some of your best plays going, especially we play Illinois team where you might get to the third, fourth quarter and be down by two or three points, you know, two or three touchdowns. You might not be able to run that play. You know, maybe it's a run, maybe it's something else. So they, they got to get a lot thrown at them and they get, they get in. I will say this, they don't run a lot of different defenses. So they sometimes they are vulnerable to being schemed up because you know what they're going to be in. Now they're very sound in what they are in, right? Um, I've also said this is that the, the level of quarterback play uh, starts to drastically go down from the first to fourth quarter. Uh, we've seen the last two quarterbacks go out, Tanner Morgan and Casey Thompson due to injury. But I would even say uh, Spencer Petras or uh, Graham Mertz or Brendan Armstrong, each played progressively worse each quarter. And I think that's due to some of the hits they take, right? Over and over and over again. And they start throwing the football. And then we just wear down their offensive line. Seth Coleman, who I thought had a lights out game, especially in the first half. I mean, he single-handedly was was containing, pass rushing, knocked out Casey Thompson. Um, had probably one of his best games. We keep saying that. He keeps getting better and better. So, I think there's a lot of different things uh, that go into that. So the scripted plays, I think quarterbacks play worse. But as far as the second half, I don't think we can look over, uh, uh, overlook the adjustment factor, right? I mean, uh, I do think we're more physical and we do wear people out more. And I do think our defense is on the field a lot less because we work in tandem with our offense. So I think it was 38 minutes to 22 minutes time of possession. There's only 22 minutes our defense is on the field especially for defensive linemen, that makes a huge difference uh, on how fresh you can be. And I wouldn't say we're really super deep at D-line. I think, I think we're solid, but uh, our front line's uh, exceptional. Yeah, I got to give kudos to Barry Loney Jr. I know maybe in, you know some fans were saying, hey, well, let's throw some deep shots. Let's end this game. They play great complimentary football of owning the clock. The second half, Jay, they're yeah. a plus 50 in time of possession this year, 50 minutes. Uh, in the fourth quarter, they're plus 34. Uh, and that's, that's almost as many minutes as the other team has the ball. Um, so they are playing complimentary football that way. Like, how do you see the offense kind of helping 
close these games as well. Well, I just, I think Barry Lennon's done a tremendous job, but I, oh, let's just talk about Tommy DeVito. I mean, first of all, you only have two incompletions. That's only twice that the ball's actually, the, the clock's going to stop when you throw the football, right? <laughs> think about that. So, I mean, just real sim simplicity is like the incomplete pass is the ultimate clock stopper, right? And so, because even if you go out of bounds in college football and it's outside of two minutes, they'll, they'll, they'll run the clock, right? Even if you get a first down, once they reset the chains, uh, they'll run the clock. And so when you don't have that many incompletions and uh, you're throwing you know, what we'll say is possession receptions, you're not necessarily throwing the football down the field, that chews it up, right? But I will say Barry Lunny, you know, does a tremendous job of, uh, you know, mixing the run, mixing the pass and, and really playing to DeVito's strengths. I, I just can't say that enough. I mean, Tommy DeVito, uh, we could talk a whole you know section on Tommy DeVito, but I think his game management, his clock awareness, I mean, we never really think about how many times he snaps the ball with less than five seconds to go. And very few times is he caught with a you know, delay of gain or, a, or a, having to take a timeout. People are where they need to be. And a lot of times they're switching up. A lot of times Chase Brown is, you know, defenses are lining up to maybe opposite of Chase Brown because they in, in the shotgun because they feel like, okay, they're probably going to run the zone or the counter to chase that side. And a lot of times with 10 seconds, they'll, they'll switch chase sides, you know, real late, which makes it very difficult for a defense then to adjust. And if they don't get in their hole, maybe there is half a gap out that leads to more big runs. And so I think the balance, the shifting late, the use of the clock, all those goes into how Barry Lenny's called his offense. And we'll go over this in the film room a little bit, Jay, but um, he did a good job because one thing his receivers struggle to do is, is get separation down the field, right? Like it, but he, he did a good job of scheming some things open, whether it was Isaiah with these rub routes, a lot of drags, uh, and then the Chase Brown touchdown. Uh, and, and Tip Ryman had a couple big first downs. Like, there's a lot of attention to Chase Brown. They seem to take advantage of that. Yeah, no, I think I, I, I love it because it, re it reminds me so much of when actually we played in the Rose Bowl. We were so geared up to stop the run, and I think they ran like 11 play actions in a row, uh, like to start the Rose Bowl. And I just remember being like, you know, it just totally takes you out of your game as a defender. Cause like one, you're just, you're running this way and you're running that way and you're getting tired. You may never even get, get to the ball. You know, you just want to hit somebody, right? You're like, you're geared up, you're playing chase Brown, the number one league, the number one rusher in the, so you can't look at their, their perspective. Hey, they're number one rusher. You know, the defensive coach is like, Hey, they might beat us, but number two is not going to be, it's all the cliches that, you know, they say that they're going to do. And they just feed off that tip. Ryman's wide open for some easy pitching catches. Right. I also thought, um, I thought Chase Brown's best play was Isaiah's touchdown. I mean, he threw two blocks. I don't think people see that, right? He and, tried to give a third. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he tried to get a third. So it's funny because, you know, Chase kind of blocked a guy kind of halfway before Isaiah was past him. He kind of knew Isaiah was going to run him. So then he went up to the next guy, got in front of him, blocked him, and tried to throw a third. So I, kudos to Chase. But to your point, I think when you have a running attack like that, you can open up the play action and, and easy play action. That was pitch and catch to tip Ryman. Yeah. All right, Jay, I want to play a little game with you about this defense, the, the fire department. Um, I'm going to name a defender and, and you tell me if he's all big 10 and if he's first team, second team or third team. I, I want to know yeah. how many all big 10 defenders are on this team. John. Okay. Newton. First team, all big 10. Is he big 10 defense player of the year? I think he's in the, he's in the top three. I mean, we've got some defender, some, but if you look at every week, I mean, I don't think he has one necessarily splash game, but he's like the guy from, I'm going to mispronounce the guy's name from Ohio State who played yeah. Penn State, right? But I think you look at what he does as far as for pressure and activity, I think he's definitely, definitely a first-team Big Ten. He's probably a, he's probably in the All-American conversation as well. Keith Randolph. I think he's the second, second All-Big Ten player. I, I actually think that going in, I had Keith rated higher as Johnny. Uh I don't think Keith has played bad. I actually think he's played really well. I think Johnny has been able to make a few more splash plays in uh, as far as pressuring the quarterback. I feel like uh, Keith, I think they're both good. I, I think Keith is a second team, all big 10 guy right now. He could be first. How, however, he trends in some of these bigger games. Uh, I think Keith is really solid on the run. He, the, uh, as If you see the amount of uh, coverage with his wingspan, he actually gets on a run play. It's incredible, the use of his hands. I do think Johnny has been a little bit more um, 
advanced when it comes to pass rushing and getting to the quarterback. And I think that's what gives Johnny a little bit of the edge as far as first to second team, but great players. I'm glad you mentioned this guy because I'm going to keep hyping him. Seth Coleman. I think Seth Coleman could be a first team all Big Ten player. Um, I, I don't think he necessarily started as fast, struggled in the Wyoming game. Uh, a little bit in the Indiana game, but you talk about a guy that's improved the most. He's probably my most improved defensive player uh, this year. And I think you look at the numbers, uh, they speak for themselves as far as actual disruptive game-changing plays. Um, I believe it was, was it Seth Coleman? Who hit, who hit Petrus? Was Seth Coleman? Well, or no? He- Morgan was Akis. Uh, Petrus, yes, was Coleman, and Coleman hit Thompson on on the interception. Right. I, so I, I think I think, but you know, two of the bigger picks. I mean, th- these are plays that they don't count as sacks, but but they're they're exponentially greater than sacks. Um, so you know, game changing plays, right? I mean, that's a game changing play. It goes it goes it goes as a quarterback hit, but that quarterback hit created two turnovers, right? Um, so, so all of those right there is, is, is something I think that, that he's a first team, all big 10 player. I agree. I, I think he's playing as, as well as anybody. Gabe Ackes, a freshman. <laughs> yeah. I think Gabe's going to be an honorable mention all big 10. I think he's going to be first team, you know, freshman, all big 10. I think he'll be a freshman, all American. I, I do. I, um, I think partially you have so many players on this defensive line that you can't have everybody be first team from Illinois, but I think he's an honorable mention guy. I do think he's a future, you know, first team, all big 10, possibly all American and an NFL player. Uh, yeah. I was just say Calvin Avery, the linebackers, probably not, but they've yeah. done their job well for the most part. Right. Like I, I don't think any of those guys are all big 10, even though we've highlighted yeah. Calvin's had some right. really good performances. Yeah. I think Calvin's been really solid. Uh, for what you ask a nose tackle to do. A nose tackle will never have the production usually of a, of a four technique, a, a four eye, which is what Johnny and uh, Keith are or defensive end uh, just by nature of kind of how they line up linebacker wise. I, you know, I think if you look at the tape, I think Tariq Barnes, you know, could be an honorable mention guy. I think he's a really solid football player and, you know, I don't think dark Angelo will get awards, but I think he, for what they ask him to do and his contributions, I think he's very solid. And, you know, I, I first time I've seen it, but I think Calvin Hart has had a cast on his hand. Uh, I saw that in some like hype video and I think it was like an orange cast. So it's kind of, but you know, I, I think Calvin Hart's probably been playing hurt. We just don't know about it. Right. So, I mean, there's probably some stuff involved there that he'll, he could be better if he wasn't so banged up. I thought, I thought he had one of his better games against Nebraska, yeah. by the way, um, Devin Witherspoon. I, I think it's a pretty clear. Yes. <laughs> I mean, Devin Witherspoon, there was some there was some group that said he's gonna be like the 10th pick overall or something. Um last week they came out. I mean, what he did to Trey Palmer was uh, I mean, this is a guy, and Mark Whipple's been known to to really highlight receivers. Last year they had that receiver, I can't remember, he played for Pitt and, and transferred to USC. He was like the transfer portal guy. Who's that? Jordan Addison. Yeah, I want, that. I want, the, I want him on the Bears. Yeah. yeah Jordan Addison, good great player, right? So he's got a way to, to highlight great receivers. And he's done that with Trey Palmer and Palmer was such a non-factor and spoon is one. I mean, we know he can get in people's head, but I mean, he's so physical at the point of attack. I don't think he had a clean release the whole time. And uh, it kind of just, it, it kind of felt, I don't know if it was in, they just kind of gave up on getting the ball to him. Um, looking for him, play design. I know the, the backup quarterback was in, I think Witherspoon is if you were to say what is the who's the best football player on our team right now, I would actually think it's Witherspoon. I I, w- I I mean I know he doesn't get the carries of Chase Brown or he's not Johnny Newton, but as far as per position, who grades the highest, who has the best, and I would say it's Devin Witherspoon. He's got the most edge of anybody. This old defense has a huge edge to it. I mean, we'll get to Quan Martin and his True. game, but. Yeah. Uh, I wish I had the all 22 to see exactly what he was doing. They, the TV doesn't show, uh, sure. you know, Palmer against Devin Witherspoon a lot, but boy, Jay, uh, what, what he, and I think Quan was on him a lot too. And yeah. Quan playing free safety and everywhere um, was pretty impressive. They were just jamming him. It seemed. Like. Yeah. I think the, the most important, I mean, Quan makes it look easy. Like that first pick, he just looks easy. I never met a guy like Quan who, you know, 
the the two the, the pick he had at uh, Minnesota was incredible. The pick he got here was he he didn't look up till late. I mean, he just kind of put his hands up and caught it. Then the one he saw, he he didn't catch. You know, which was interesting. But uh, you know, I think what surprised him about Quan, I think since he's been here, he's always been a great athlete, right? Athleticism has never been the issue. But I see him playing with really good technique, and he's physical. He had a big hit on the tight end on third and one. He had a big hit on the last fumble where he just picked up the guy in, you know, like a sack of flour and dumped him. Um, So Quan's a lot. I've seen him grow. Witherspoon has always been physical. Sydney's always been physical. Uh, I've seen Quan really grow in his physicality and and, and Quan's versatility. I don't know what position you say Quan is. If there was a nickelback to say like, like, hey, I think I don't, I don't see how there's a better nickelback in the conference. I, I really don't like, I mean, so I know that you're going to, I'm going to, it's going to end up with like two or three, you know, all big 10 players, but I, I would say that, you know, he's, a, he's at least a second team, all big 10 player. Um, but I don't know if there's a, if there was a position for Nickelback, which there usually yeah. is not, I would say he, he would be first team because he does a lot of different things. I think he'll probably be at safety. I would have him first team. If I, if my vote yeah. would do today, I would have him and Devin first team for sure. Sydney kind of had his moment, right? Like he's played well all year. I think you and I, Jay, know the importance of, of a rover kind of safety like sure. that to this defense. But uh, w- would you have him all Big Ten? Well, here's the here's the crazy thing: is Kendall's got the got the interceptions, right? But I guess Quan's catching up. I, I, and I heard PJ say this after the game. Sydney Brown, PJ Flex said this after the Minnesota game. He said Sydney Brown has the ability to be on the line, at line of scrimmage, and also play half the field. That's an incredible ability to have. I think when you look at from the leadership perspective that he brings, the physicality, you know, as, as coach says, generating a lot of power in a short space. Uh, and, you know, got got two picks this game. Um, you know, I don't know if he's necessary. And, and here's with Sydney. He takes enough chances as a rover near the ball. He's going to miss some tackles. He's going to hit some people, right? Um if you had to tell me who do I got to take Quan or Sydney for this? And I hate to play this game. Right. But like, I think Sydney does so much from everything from leadership to, to run game and support. I would take Sydney and I would actually put Sydney as a first team defender. I know he doesn't necessarily have uh, maybe the, maybe the coverage skills. Uh, he's often on the tight end, but maybe the, not the coverage skills of Quan. Uh, nor the nor the nor the ball skills of Quan, um, but I just think what he does. I think Sydney's a first team guy. When you think of the the disruption he causes and and the help in the run game that he does, Kendall might have the stats for it um, <laughs> with his interceptions and and Taz right. Nicholson's played played really well. So I don't know if those guys get on there. Um, Kendall might uh, based on if guys are just going. I, I think Kendall's going to be. Uh, I think he gets he gets hurt by the fact that Kirby got on there last year with five, and maybe it's just the same defense and whatnot. I think he'll be honorable mention at least. But I, I but I mean we we've been saying this a long time. I mean since the beginning of probably since week two that we thought there was five legit NFL players on this team. You know the three defensive backs, Brown, Martin, and Witherspoon, and and Newton and Randolph. How many of those guys come back? Uh, I'm not necessarily sure. It, it, you know, we, we won't speculate on that, but, but Witherspoon's probably a guy that it would be hard pressed to come back with, with some of the ratings he's, he's getting initially if he stays healthy. And it, it makes me burp a little bit. There you go. <laughs> well, yeah. That, that's, and then you have Akis eventually. I think Seth Coleman. Has yeah. 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 So, I mean, I, it's seven, seven guys, all Big Ten. Is that, is that what we're settling on? Seven or eight all Big Ten defenders on this defense? I I, I mean, it, it seems silly to do it because Illinois, I don't know if Illinois ever had that. Oh. Um, it's the best defense in the country right now, statistically, so it's not ridiculous. Um, so it's, it's, got, it's got a lot of it. I think, I think the Michigan game will go a long way in, in where these guys kind of line up because they're going to be competing against – guys from Michigan and Ohio state for those, you know, all big 10 spots. So, uh, but, but they, they've done it and they've done it consistently week in and week out. So it's a special D is Seth Coleman have a chance to come back. He's yeah, a junior. He, he's got two more years if he wants it. He's the fourth <laughs> year. He's the fourth year sophomore, Jay. I know that always trips you up, but yeah, I mean, he's a guy that I think should start getting NFL. I mean, this, the length and athleticism yeah. and speed and, 
I mean, he dropped back in coverage, Jay, and had a pass breakup. <laughs> yeah, no, I, mean, I, I think I think we could have two monster defensive ends. I, you know, you know, and and I think Johnny, depending on how he finished the game, could be gone. But but I think Keith would probably stay. Um, again, this is all speculation. I thought Kalen Tolson would never leave, and he left. Right. So I mean, um, I think Brett's thing is if they're a first or second round pick, we're going to bless you and hey, it's time to go. But if there's if you're a third round pick and we could develop you into a first or second round pick, like let's, let's do that because you do kind of get pigeonholed, whether you're a free agent or a third round pick that three, first three or four years, that's what you're going to be paid no matter what. And so it's, it's a big difference. Uh, Jay, you mentioned Tommy Vito. I just want to hit on him again real quick. I mean, this is weird <laughs> with Chase Brown having 149 yards and two touchdowns, sure. but near perfect. Um, the one, two were really throwaways, the two incompletions, sure. right? The one to Pat Bryan on a fade and then he just threw one out of bounds um the accuracy the the quick release the decision making uh and just the the pocket feel he made so many plays with his feet the other day whether it's prolonging um he's just been everything they could have wanted right um everything and more uh you mentioned the feet you know and and not just the scramble i think one one time it was the second and long and they did a quarterback draw. I picked up 15 and then a 15 yard penalty after that. And then I also really like to see him keep it on the, um, on the counter. So uh, I think what people don't realize what's so hard about the quarterback keep on the counter is in front of a linebacker, he's going to see that guard and tackle pull around and you've got the number one rusher following those guys. So your read is to follow the guard, follow the tackle. Well, man, it's a whole different ball game. Now, if, DeVito keeps it. There's nobody there unless the corner can make the play, which he didn't, right? And now I'm thinking, well, now, now when I see the counter, I can't be as fast to the counter as I was because DeVito can do that. So now Chase is going to have one less defender there. But I think just his poise, his pocket feel, you know, never feels rattled, never feels rushed. And I think more than more than anything is like, he's earned a ton, like a ton of his teammates have confidence in him. Like, I think the offense just has confidence that we got Tommy, he's going to make it work. Right. I think that is probably the biggest thing we see is that from a defensive offense perspective, a team perspective, they have confidence in Tommy. Well, Jay, here we go. Illinois seven and one. They're atop the big 10 West by a game. They're number 14 in the country. They come home for two games with a chance to clinch a spot in the big 10 championship game and go up to Ann Arbor a top 10 team with nothing to lose and everything to gain. But before they get there, they've done a great job of compartmentalizing every week, right? Like I know they're thinking about big 10 West, but each week they seem focused. Uh, Michigan state is a mess, uh, both on the field and seemingly in the tunnel. Yeah. Um, right. But Illinois needs this one to, to keep pressure on Purdue and make the Saturday following uh, a clincher. So what, what do you think are the keys Against Michigan State, that's got some explosiveness offense. Well, I mean, it's, it, Michigan State, ever you know, who's the coach of Michigan State? It seemed like they always have athletes. Yeah. I mean, let, let's, let's, and they've, they've had some success in the transfer portal getting some athletes there. Some of those guys have got suspended, but yeah, but, but yeah, they've had some success. Um, you know, what's interesting to me is that, you know, two of the next, actually, the next three weeks, we're going to play you know, Illinois quarterbacks. Aiden O'Connell was an Illinois quarterback. Peyton Thorne is a, a quarterback. J.J. McCarthy is quarterback, right? And Tommy DeVito gets to go up against them. So it's kind of like they got a guy in Peyton Thorne um, who's an Illinois guy, right? Naperville Central. And um, a lot of Illinois players on the Michigan State team um, that can make plays, right? Peyton Thorne's a good player. Um, has had his best year this year, but I think that when you talk about the keys of this game, um, it's it's going to come down to the same old, same old, which is taking care of the football, red zone, and then ultimately weathering the storm, which they've done really well the last, or let's just say the last four games. Well, Wisconsin had a, had a run. They responded, right? They were down. Uh, uh, there was a flutter of stuff in that Iowa game right before the end of the half, a couple of fumbles and whatnot, muff punt. They withstood that. Uh, the the kick return against Minnesota. So, will they be able to respond? I think they built confidence to do that. But this is a game we look at, and it feels like it's like we should just say we should win. And it's, it's it feels so weird to say that, Jeremy, because we've never really been in that position, right? 
but it's like, oh, top to bottom roster wise, uh, we should win. I think Mel Tucker's a good coach. I think Brett Bielma, one of the hottest coaches in the country right now, I means 10 and three his last 13 games. I mean, that's better than everybody in the Big Ten other than uh, Michigan and Ohio State. I think if you look at his record, he's 12 and eight overall at Illinois. One of the best records we've seen in a very, very long time, maybe ever. I mean, I think McAvick might have been a little bit better, but it's amazing to see what's happened. And this is a game where I feel like, to get back to the original question, we do what Illinois needs to do. There's nothing, nothing special needs to happen. We just need to play our game and we should win by two or three touchdowns. That's how it should go. Well, that's why they play the game though. It could be very different. Michigan State certainly has athletes. It's going to be a fun month, Jay, to see how they stack up against Purdue in a game where I think you're the better all around team, but Purdue's dangerous. Right. And then to go to Michigan and test yourself against one of the best teams in the country. Um, and you might have a chance to do that against Ohio State, which I think sure. Ohio State's a tough matchup for, for anybody, but sure, man, what, what a month this could be for Illinois football, for Brett Bielma. I wrote afterwards, might be a good time to, to get Brett Bielma locked down in a contract right. extension. Uh, maybe get Ryan Walters locked up for a contract extension because uh, they could only add to their value uh, this next coming month. But that's, that's why you hire these guys is you hope they can do these things. The funny thing to me is I look across – you know, our rivals and other, other than Minnesota, um, I think Wisconsin, I think Iowa, and I think Nebraska at this point, if you asked 10 fans, would you take Brett Bielema as your coach? I think seven or eight of them would say yes. Right. I mean, so here, I mean, you know, some ties that he has to all those. So um, that's kind of where we're at with it right now is interesting is that finally Illinois has a big time coach. I think we, it would be, and Josh Whitman's a smart guy. The guy's not naive. I think he knows if, Illinois, if, if you win 10 games at Illinois in your second season, based on where the roster was at, you're going to get some outside attention and possibly some offers. I think the point that you made maybe two or three weeks ago was that Brett's kind of cycled through that before, right? Of going to a different job and whatnot. And so I think he's he's ripe for an extension. I keep waiting for the announcement here any day now after each win, but um, who knows? They could be in talks right now, and, and we just we just have no clue. Yeah. Well, Jay, it's it's a it's a fun time, man. Uh, any lingering thoughts otherwise that you want to part with before we go? Just enjoy it, you know. I always make the joke of, you know, sixty three was the Rose Bowl, then eighty three was the Rose Bowl. Then we had to wait till 2001 for the Sugar Bowl. We did have a Big Ten championship in Citrus Bowl in 1990. Um, but then we had to wait till 2000, you know, 2001 was Sugar Bowl, 2007 was Rose. It just doesn't happen a lot, right? And so when you get a special football season, uh, I would just, you know, encourage everyone to go support. I'm going to the game, bring my whole family to the game and enjoy it because I feel I'm so excited for these guys who really – had a tough go the last three or four years and, and certainly worked hard, but certainly didn't get the rewards they, they wanted. And, and to see them and guys like Pelcho and, and even Quan Martin and Sydney and guys that have been around here a while to have success. It's just, it's really cool to see. And I'm, I'm happy for the coaches and the players. Yeah. And Brett made the point and I understand it. It's natural to think, Oh, you could be playing this at the end. You could have this at the end. You could lose these guys in the NFL. And what's that mean for next year? But enjoy Quan Martin body slamming a Nebraska player right. a 26 9 win, right? Right. Enjoy on a Saturday afternoon, 2 30 to 6 in the afternoon, whenever we're watching that game and just being like, we're so much better than Nebraska. Like, where they can't even move the ball. And especially in the second half. And I just will, will say, like, I, I, that's something that's an interesting thing. I don't think we're going to have credit. And you mentioned, I'm glad you did, is how good a second half team we are. You, you get a lot of pub if you have collapses in the second half. And unfortunately, you don't get a lot of pub if you're really good in the second half. And we've dominated and, and, and basically broke teams physically and mentally in the second half of games. So it's good to see a coach says just feels like he's in control of the game and they have a plan of where they're going. And I will say this. Barry Lunny was a great hire. It was definitely a step up from uh, Tony Peterson. Brett knew he needed to make that move. Kudos to Josh to making that happen. Um, and again, we can't focus on the end. We just got to focus on the journey, like Brett said. Great stuff. Jalen, thanks for the time as always. We'll talk next week, man. See you guys.